Welcome to the Rebooting Business Podcast, where we discuss how businesses can reboot, rebuild, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before in a post-COVID-19 reality. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. And hello, thank you for visiting us and either listening or watching another episode of Rebooting Business. This is going to be episode number 21. And I'm your host, David Summerfleck. I'm a enterprise digital marketing specialist at www.dms.blue. And my guest today is Dr. Travis Ziegler. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You are. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today, Dr. Ziegler. Let's get started because your background is really, really interesting, at least to me anyway. Can you please get into or start with your own background and professional experience as an optometrist? How did you get started in that? And then how did you transition into what you're doing now, which is very, very unique? Yeah, so I graduated in 20 or 2003. Well, before I get started, thanks for having me on your show, first sure. of all. And then um, going back to the story, in 2003, I graduated high school and went to the Ohio State University. Um, and I studied at pre-med in undergrad there and didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be an OBGYN. Um, I also didn't know if I wanted to pursue optometry, but my uncle is an optometrist over by Ohio State. And so I ended up working for him when I was an undergrad just to have a job. And what happened was I ended up falling in love with optometry and got into school early. And so I ended up getting into school after three years of undergrad into optometry school and graduated optometry school four years later in 2010. And then in 2010, I actually started working for my uncle. The first four years of practicing optometry, I just felt like there was something missing. I was having fun, but I wasn't having a lot of fun. And I didn't feel like this was it. Like, I didn't feel like this is what I was destined to do with my life. So my wife and I, we quit our job with my uncle, which was a great job. We moved across the country from Ohio to South Carolina. And then we started two practices of our own in 2015. Wow. And when you start your own practice, it's a little slower at first. So I had a lot of time on my hands. So I came across a course called Amazing Selling Machine. And with this course, it teaches you how to pick a product, how to source a product and how to sell it online, on, more specifically on Amazon. And what we saw was that with all the three of these businesses started in 2015, we saw the practices taking off. We doubled the practices in the first year alone. And then this online store 10 x in the first year. And so we were just like, there's something to this. And after about two and a half years of building all three businesses together. So now we're in to about the 2016 end of 2016, beginning of 2017, we were exhausted. We were running two practices. We were running this online business that was over a million dollars. And we just thought we have to get rid of something. And so mm -hmm. we kind of analyzed the three businesses and looked at stress versus income ratio. And we got rid of the most stressful business first. It was the second best income, but it was the most stressful. So we got rid of that one first, which was one of our practices. Right. And, and then we had another practice and just this business. And then six months later, we ended up selling that practice too, to go full time in this, which was a very scary moment to say the least. And that was back in the beginning of 2018 was the last time I practiced. And so now here we are two and a half years later, and I haven't seen patients since. Um, I do mission trips three times a year where we go to see one to 3000 patients in a week. But as far as in the U S seeing patients, I think I've done it once in the last two mm. and a half years. And now I'm a full-time digital marketer. And our mission with our online company called I Love is to heal 1 million dry eye sufferers naturally. And then we use the profits from I Love to fund our foundation or our charity, which is to solve the problem of a billion people being blind, blind, excuse me, being blind due to lack of glasses. And so we have the mission to heal dry eye sufferers naturally. And then we have the mission to help people get glasses that cannot afford it nor that can they obtain glasses. And so with all the success of I love that we had and our ability to sell on Amazon with Amazon PPC, pay-per-click or Amazon mm -hmm. advertising being our superpower, 
other brands have asked us to help them with that. So then we started another business that's all about Amazon ads and helping brands get onto Amazon and helping them scale their Amazon presence as a result. Um, that's something that we only work with certain brands and we interview them first, but we love working with, we just love helping people get on Amazon in the agency and scale and show people why Amazon is such a viable e-commerce platform and why you need to be on there. I have a lot of questions about that and I want to circle back on your, um, your charity work, which I think is really, you know, wonderful. And I don't, you know, I don't want you to think for a minute, I'm not going to follow up on that. Uh, I think anybody, sh everybody who talks to you should be interested in that. And before we get into Amazon FBA, uh, fulfillment by Amazon, I have two questions that I want to ask you about that. Um, to what extent do you think your experience, I mean, being a you know, an actual doctor, to what extent do you think that really helped you have some appearance of authority to help the Amazon FBA, the fulfillment by Amazon process? You know, in other words, for people to want to buy your product, obviously that has something to do with it. I don't know to what extent it's going to be obvious, you know, on Amazon. Um, but obviously, if I'm going to order something, for dry eyes, which I get all the time, I'm going to order from an actual optometrist as opposed to a regular product on Amazon. So to what extent does your background and education, you know, support that, that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, I have no regrets of going to optometry, optometry school because it's led me on this, this path in life that I never thought I'd, I'd I never thought I'd retire from practicing optometry at 33 years old. I was planning on 40, but 33 came and it, it helped a lot faster, which helped me boost our online presence. Now, my wife is also an optometrist as well. And we've, it's really helped us build a community of people that are struggling. They're looking for answers online because either they're not getting it from their, their in-person doctor because dry eye is relatively new back in the nineties and even early two thousands. We were just told to give them artificial tears, which you can buy over the counter, mm -hmm. and that solves your dry eye. But it doesn't. It actually just covers up a problem. And so doctors are still very slow to adapt what's all coming out with dry eye. There are great dry eye specialists out there in every city, but most doctors, I would say 80% of doctors are still kind of just giving artificial tears. And mm -hmm. so this patient, this customer is looking online for solutions and answers, and that's where we come in. We have a Facebook group called the Dry Eye Syndrome Support Community. We have a YouTube channel called the Dry Eye Show. We have a podcast called the Dry Eye Show. And so we focus everything around this dry eye. And so when they find us, they see that we're actually optometrists as well. We were dry eye specialists when we practiced. And now we're focusing, we're, we're looking and having people approach dry eye from a different standpoint. And that standpoint is we tell you to think of dry eye as a symptom instead of a disease. And so when you think of dry eye as a symptom and your body's in an overall disease state of being inflamed, then what we do is we work on decreasing the inflammation in your body, which decreases your dry eye, which decreases your high blood pressure, your diabetes, your high cholesterol, every other disease that you have, you're going to have less symptoms and arthritis and autoimmune conditions. So it's, it's, it makes it easier for them to follow us, having that authority, having that doctor behind our name. But the truth of this is that we took this Eastern medicine route for dry eye because of something that happened in our lives. We were told that we could never have kids mm -hmm. and we followed the Western medicine system. We did everything but IVF and that's in vitro fertilization for those that don't know it. IVF is a very intense process with a lot of hormones and medicines and chemicals involved. And we didn't feel like it was right for us. So we explored Eastern medicine and did acupuncture, changed our diet. We're, we're pretty much vegetarian most of the time, even vegan at sometimes. And we just changed our diet just a little bit more. And then we just increased healthy fats. And within three months, we got pregnant following that regimen versus three years following the Western medicine approach. And so that completely rattled our system and shook us to the core of like, are we really doing our patients a disservice by just giving them artificial tears and not really getting to the source of the problem? And so that's 
would also put this whole trajectory of our I love business down that path. And so to go back to your original question, yes, it does help to have that doctor in front of our name because people instantly trust us as a result of having that in front of our name. And they're going to listen to us as a result of that. The funny thing is people ask us all the time if we're real doctors and yes, yes we are. We're, we're doctors of optometry. <laughs> well, I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you, you legally, you can't walk around and say, I'm a doctor of, of optometry and you're really not. I yeah, mean, it, it, 100% correct. <laughs> I mean, it would open you up to all kinds of liability and misrepresentation. At least I hope, I would hope so. Yeah. Um, let me ask you one other question before we get into the Amazon technicalities. Obviously, I've been to my fair share of optometrists. Okay. Why aren't more optometrists doing more online? So many of them don't even have modern websites, don't use SEO, and certainly don't sell on Amazon. And if they do, not correctly or to the extent that you, you're doing it. Do you no. see a disconnect or is it just me as a webhead? You know, you're a webhead and now I am too. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of biased towards this, this area, but I think you're going to see that change with COVID coming and COVID's going to really change how all optometrists look at, the, at their business model because they relied so much on the brick and mortar side yeah. of things that now that it's shaken up a little bit, that they're going to have to look for other sources online. And when we're offering that to doctors that we wholesale to is to set up a website for them, a very simple website where when they refer people to us, they actually get a 30%. It's just a, a simple affiliate marketing. We're mm -hmm. giving them a 30% affiliate commission as a result. And we're giving them like a 90 day cookie from those referrals that they send. And so how we're positioning this is you're a wholesaler for our product in your office. You sell it to them at the point of purchase, but then you give them a sheet at checkout saying either come back in to order from us, or you can just go to this website right here and you can order it directly. When they type in that website, it clicks their affiliate link in right then. Right. And they get that 90 day cookie with a 30% affiliate commission. And so every time that, that customer visits that website, it kicks back in again. And so they get 30% every time. So we're having a lot more interest in that as a result of this COVID happening. This is a program we've had for two and a half years and nobody cared. And I think it's because they just, there's so much going on day to day. You're dealing with insurance companies, you're dealing with your staff, you're dealing with inventory, you're dealing with the patient that's in front of you, which is the most important part. But unfortunately it's kind of the thing we have the least time for. And there's so much going on to run a practice day to day that it's just hard to even consider selling online because I'm doing this full time. My team is doing this full time. We have a team of about seven of us that are doing this full time. And for an optometrist to come in and try to, to take the, the market position that we've already come into, it's going to be very hard to do that. And it's going to take a lot of time, money and resources. And so it's very hard to go up against people like, like us, but also people like Warby Parker. Warby Parker is valued mm -hmm. at over a billion dollars and they're selling glasses online for a hundred dollars. And there's no way an optometrist can compete with that because they're selling glasses for 500 to a thousand. And the difference is, I mean, there's not a huge difference, but it's the quality. You're going to pay for better quality. Warby Parker doesn't have bad quality, but it's all their own brand. And right. the lenses aren't the best in the world, but they're, they're still good. So you're going up against these behemoths. Like we're small fish compared to like Warby Parker. There's Hubble contacts that sell contacts. There's 1-800 contacts that, you know, they sell every brand of contact lenses. So there's just so much competition that you're going up against that it's hard to outmarket and outspend all these different organizations. The problems that we have is we're going against pharmaceutical companies that have unlimited budgets. Right. And so when we're advertising on Amazon and on Google, we have to be more intelligent and we have to be swift and quick to move to new areas very, very quickly because they just will throw as much money as they can at the thing. Right. And so we just have to outmaneuver them by being just, we're just scrappier because we're smaller. We're not, you know, a billion dollar company or a $14 billion company, pharmaceutical company that has to go through a bunch of ropes just to get approved to sell on Amazon. So um, I think it's just, it's a lot harder to compete with what's out there. We have trouble competing with the pharmaceutical companies, but 
we stay competitive because we have our audience and we've built that up on Facebook and on YouTube and on our website and our email list as well. Okay. I want to get into the whole web design thing, but I'm not going to, I'm going to stay away from that for at least for, <laughs> for now. Why should someone list their product on Amazon and as opposed to selling it on their own website or on social media only as many people do? Can someone sell a service on Amazon and is it worth getting into that arena? Yeah, so there, I'll address the second question first just because it's a quick answer. You can sell a service. I don't know about an optometry service, but you can sell anything on Amazon. There's, I mean, I buy my um, house cleaning on Amazon. You can buy essentially anything on Amazon as a service too. Um, I don't know much about the service side of things, but as far as the product side of things, if you're a brand owner, and this is going away from optometry a little bit, if you're just a brand owner in general that is selling things online on your Shopify store on your WooCommerce store and you're not on Amazon, that's a, a huge mistake because Amazon alone, just, I'm gonna read you some stats right here that I have in front of me. Oh, 2016, yeah. they did 136 billion, 136 wow. billion. 2017, they, they increased by 31% to 178 billion. 2018 was 233 billion. And in 2019, they, they were projected to do that 30% growth again. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, they're growing even faster as a result of COVID happening. And so people, when they go to buy something, they don't go to Google anymore. They, they do, but they go to Amazon more. And when yes. people search on Amazon, they're looking to buy. When people search on Google, they're looking to learn. And so the buyer-based search intent marketing on Amazon and the buyer search intent that is going on there. If your brand isn't on there, you're losing a lot of income and you're losing money to your competitors because even if you're running Facebook ads, if I go, if I'm scrolling Facebook and I see an ad, the first thing I do is I go over to Amazon to see if it's on there because I can click it with two, two clicks or I can buy it with two clicks. And then if I can't get it on Amazon, I may go back to that Facebook ad. I may go to their website and I may buy it on their website, but then I know I have to put all my address and stuff in, then I have to put my credit card information in, and it's just more of a pain. And so if you're a brand owner and you're not on Amazon, it's a huge mistake because they're going over there to look for you. And if you're not there, they may not come back to purchase from you. So that's yes. why I think you have to list your product on Amazon. Even if you're not going to put a bunch of money behind it, just having it up there and just having it there for people to find, you'll make a ton of sales just that way. I, I agree with you as someone who's on the internet, you know, I don't want to say all day, every day, but a good portion of most days, we're either working with clients or working on my own projects. And, you know, I just wanted to interject. If you go to Google Shopping, uh, shopping.google.com, which is an aggregate of all the different e-commerce platforms out there um, searching through Google, so many of these are not well known, not well established, and some of them are phishing sites, uh, meaning that they're not legitimate. I actually did some shopping yesterday. So, and, and I think it really adds to Amazon's already established credibility. You know, uh, we, we have groceries delivered to Amazon, Amazon Prime, Amazon Fresh, Amazon Pantry. Um, and, and certainly their numbers, like you said, have just uh, really skyrocketed with COVID. As far as service providers, I haven't looked at Amazon, whatever they call the service providers in some time, but I don't think I saw optometrists. There's more, more service industry, uh, like what you were saying, someone to clean your home or maybe uh, come over and do some repair work. It didn't seem to be that broad at that time. Uh, how can a business owner differentiate themselves and their offerings in what is obviously, I don't want to say glutted, but an already very full offering? Yeah, you know, with that great question. And so many people just throw up a product on Amazon and don't optimize it. And so this is your opportunity to really shine on Amazon. There's a lot of great things that you can do to make your listing look really, really good. The first thing you need to do is if you have a trademark on your product, you get it brand registered in Amazon. 
when you get it brand registered, it opens up a whole tool of a suite of tools to really enhance your product and your brand on Amazon. So if you don't have brand registry or trademark, don't worry about that. So we'll talk about that first. Okay. If you don't have it, even if you do have it, you want to do this for both, but you want to great photos are huge because you got to think about when somebody's shopping in a retail setting, they're grabbing it, they're holding it, they're turning it, they're looking at it in every angle and they may even open the box. And so what you want to do with your photos is you want to have the photo of the box. Of course, you want to have it open to see what's inside and then mm -hmm. all sides of it. And then you want to have some lifestyle images. And one of my favorite hacks with photos that most people do not do. And even we don't, we're guilty of not doing it on all of our listings just because we always split test things when we roll them out. Split testing for your audience that doesn't know it just means testing one photo versus another. Another, But with photos, mm -hmm. what you can do is you can go against your competitor or go over to your competitor, look at their reviews. I use a, a, a tool called Helium 10 for this. And I scrape all the reviews and I see what keeps popping up in the good reviews. So like it says gentle on my eyelids, for example. And so then I will put gentle on my eyelids in one of the photos as like kind of a feature or a benefit of that product. And then I'll put that same thing gentle on my eyelids as a bullet point because people keep saying it over and over in their reviews. You want to talk the language of the customer. And so wow. we do that for the photos. We do that for the bullets. And then we look for words that keep repeating over and over and over again in the top um, products that are selling. And so we use Helium 10 to scrape the top 10 listings for a particular product. And like, for example, eyelid wipes, eyelid wipes, we'll type in eyelid wipes in Amazon, analyze the first 10 products. And then we'll look at the words that are repeated over and over again. And we put those into the bullets as well into the title, but then we also put it in what's called the back back end search terms. The back end search terms just tells Amazon how to rank your product, how to, when somebody types in something to search for it, you'll show up for that term, hence the name search term. And so we always put the benefits in the bullets, the benefits in the photos, and then we put all the features and all the other words in the title and also in the, the back end. So really optimizing the listing to make it look really good is huge. And then when you scroll further down on your listing, there's something called a description. You can either have enhanced brand content description, which has more pictures, or you can just have a normal description. Same thing. We're, we're going to add a ton of benefits for your product. We're going to add great photos, lifestyle images that really make your, your product listing just kind of pop out a little bit more. And then the biggest thing, as we all know, is social proof. Mm -hmm. You need to have social proof on your listing. And so that's ratings and reviews. There's two programs inside Amazon as at the time of this recording. It's called the Early Reviewer Program. You can give it, or it's it's sixty dollars, and you can give it to give your product to six people to review. There's also what's called the Amazon Vine Program, where you can give it to thirty different people to give you reviews. And so that's thirty six reviews that you can get right off the bat, but you just have to give your product away to do it. And I think it's a sixty dollar investment total plus the product that you give away. So social reviews or social proof is huge. So making sure you get those ratings and reviews up. We use a tool called Managed by Stats to get review requests out there. And so we, after 10 days of after the product has been delivered, we ask for reviews from customers as well. And so that's building up your reviews in the system. And then you have to provide good customer service. That's just, Absolutely. it's seems so simple, but so many people fail at this and Amazon will shut you down if you don't respond to your customers within 24 hours seven days a week, 365 days of the year. So you have to respond within 24 hours. Otherwise they'll penalize you. If you get too many penalties, they'll actually shut down your account and you don't want that. So we have, you know, our customer service rep that works for us. She works every single day, but I tell her she doesn't listen to me, but on Saturday and Sunday, I tell her, just check the Amazon messages. Don't do anything else, but she does everything else. She texts our phone. She texts our email, everything. I tell her not to do that. I tell her just to check the Amazon so she can have some time off, sure. but she goes above and beyond. So to, to kind of re-emphasize everything, make sure you have a great listing with great photos, bullets, title, everything like that. Great lifestyle images, ratings and reviews, and then also great customer service. That is how you differentiate your products on Amazon. And I and, and I just want to add as well that basically what you described 
is we used to call it competitive competitive research, basically spying on your competitors, and it's just smart marketing. It's it's, it's hard, not at all new, and it's it's, it's just smart. Um, every business that's trying to scale should be doing that. Um, that was, in fact, one of my earliest jobs was for a company doing that competitive uh, research, and they would we we used to put together reports all day long. That was all we did. It was horrible. Extremely tedious work. Um, that's when I started needing glasses, just looked, going through this data all day long and competitive data. Um, and also what you described really is SEO, search engine optimization, providing relevant content with the, um, the, the, the listing and the benefits and the features. Um, now, do you think there's a contradiction of using e-commerce and then using Amazon? And um, can you explain your approach to that and your view of sales funnels? And it's an overused term. So I would ask you to, you know, when people talk about sales funnels, a lot of people who are not experienced in marketing or digital marketing don't really know what sales funnels are. And I'm trying to do a pyramid image here without looking crazy on video, but it's basically funneling what the user sees. So do you, do you agree with that? And can you kind of get into your approach and, and your opinion on that? Yeah. Um, you know, every, every great e-commerce brand has kind of this, they, they've kind of figured everything out. They've figured out direct response. They figured out, you know, your Shopify site, they figured out Amazon and they've put them all together. That's how you really get into the, like the, the, the eight and nine figure brands is because they've got all those pieces together. Now, how we started our business is we focus a hundred percent on Amazon and we still do. We focus a hundred percent on Amazon because that's what we know. And when we started going after the direct response market and the Shopify market, what happened was our Amazon started sinking. Our Shopify went up a little bit but our, our profits went down, our revenue stayed the same, and it didn't really grow. So this year, we actually went back to the Amazon model, 100% focus on Amazon. We have Shopify, we have ClickFunnels, which is a sales funnel software, mm -hmm. but we don't focus on those anymore. And the funny thing is we're spending, last year we were spending like $30,000 just on our website. And this year we're spending like four and we're making just as much. And the reason we're able to do that is because, and that's on advertising spend on like Facebook ads, is because we refocus everything to be on Amazon. So our profits are up. But what's happening is we're creating this whole ecosystem of where people can find us. So they say that people need to find you seven times or see you seven times to really get to know you as a brand and really start to trust you. There's also an old adage as well that, that people need to see you on three different channels in order to trust you. So for us, they see us on Facebook, YouTube, Shopify, Amazon, and then our podcast. And so there's multiple different channels that are all funneling people in. Yeah. And then I'm showing up on podcasts like yourself. So they're hearing me in one area on somebody else's podcast or YouTube channel. And then they're hearing me on my own. And then they just see us everywhere. And we do that on purpose. So the top of our funnel is our blog posts. Our blog posts we actually drive Google traffic to our blog posts and the blog posts talk about the problem that our product solves. Right. And then what we do is we talk about how our, our, our product will solve that problem. And then when they click to buy the product, it actually takes them over to Amazon. This is going to make Shopify brand owners shop people that sell on Shopify a lot cringe because I'm taking them from my Shopify site over to Amazon. But I do that because Amazon loves external traffic and it boosts us up in the rankings. But what happens is when we do that, that little funnel right there, that's the top of the funnel. They're searching for their problem. They end up on a blog post. They go to buy on Amazon. We have a pretty good conversion rate on that. And it works really well. We get about a four to five ROAS return on ad spend on just that, that type of marketing. But we've now got this pixel audience of people that have been on our blog. So we take that pixel audience and we retarget them with more blog posts. And so they start seeing us on their Facebook feed more and more. They start seeing us, we invite them to join our group, our Facebook group called the Dry Eye Syndrome Support Community. And so they're gonna see us on a Facebook page, they're gonna see us on a group, and then we try to get them to follow us on YouTube. 
So now they're starting to see us over and over and over again. And they're watching our videos over and over again. And so with Facebook ads, what we do is we retarget those people that have visited our dry blog with not just products. We also retarget them to watch our videos. And so we'll pay the through play on Facebook to get them to watch our videos. We'll retarget them with YouTube videos. So when they're on YouTube, YouTube, our ads, our ads will show up. They're actually just videos. And so if they're searching for how to get rid of a sty, it's going to be our video talking about how to get rid of a sty, but it's actually an ad and they think they're watching the video that they, they clicked on, but it's actually us as an ad because we're just talking about exactly what they search for. And the reason we do that is we don't really care if we make a sale from that YouTube video, it's costing us five cents for somebody to watch a video of ours for 30 seconds or more, mm -hmm. or to even click through on YouTube, the learn more button, five cents. And so I will pay five cents all day for somebody to see my face, to hear me talking, to learn my name and my wife's name. And I'll do that over and over again. So we do that with both the agency and we do that with the e-commerce side too. So once they get into that dry eye blog top of the funnel, I then keep bringing them down to watch more of our videos. And once they've engaged a couple of times with our blog, we'll then start focusing on products. And then once they show up on our product pages, we then give them coupon codes and discounts to get them all the way down into the, the funnel to purchase. Now, this doesn't count the, the people that I send over to Amazon to purchase because we can't really track that data yet because it's just, it's a little more complicated because Amazon doesn't release all the data that we need to do that. Right. And so I 100% believe in sales funnels and I believe you need to be everywhere. Um, I didn't mention that we also do display advertising. And so display advertising is when you've been on our website, or when you've been on Amazon, we do this with Amazon too, that when you're shopping a, a website like, or when you're on a website like CNN, you'll see our ads all over that too. So we kind of do a combination of all this stuff, but it didn't start that way. It started with Amazon and then it expanded to Facebook retargeting ads on, on Shopify. And then we did Google search ads for problems that our product solves. And then we added the display advertisement. So we started with one and then we've slowly added as we've gotten bigger and our team's grown and we've been able to to add some things like that. Does that all make sense? Well, it does to me. I could geek out and talk to you all day long about this. And, <laughs> and, and anyone listening or watching would probably go into like a narcoleptic stupor. Um, and their eyes would probably roll up into their heads, which wouldn't be good to, to see either. Let me ask you, to what extent do you look at key performance indicators or KPIs for your website SEO and to what extent do you get into other external factors like uh, Google AdWords? I don't know if they changed the name recently or not, but it was Google AdWords. You have Facebook ads, Facebook Pixel, which link links the website to Facebook advertising. To what extent do you dig down deep into that? Big time. It, okay, it, but in comparison to just saying, look, Amazon, is, is buttering our bread. Yeah, so great question. And I am obsessed with measuring everything that gets done. So if you don't measure it, you're not really ever gonna know what works. And so we try to introduce a new advertising platform of some kind every single quarter. And then what we do is we analyze all the ones that we're doing and whichever one's not performing the best, we may shut it down, depending if we wanna shut it down or not. And we may use that, that funding to do a different advertising platform. So our main one is Google ads, not the one that we spend the most on, but our best return on ad spend is Google ads, but it's for search intent marketing for the problem that the product solves, not for the product. So if you're searching eyelid wipes, we're not going for that term. I didn't even know we're there going was such a thing. What's that? I didn't even know there was such a thing as is, is yeah. an eyelid wipe. Uh, eyelid wipe. So the problem that eyelid wipes solve is blepharitis and dry mm. eye. And so what we're doing is we're going after, after the term blepharitis. They're going to an article talking about what blepharitis is, what causes it, and how you can help it. And there's our, our eyelid wipe to click over to buy to Amazon. So Google ads is our main, it's our best return on ad spend because we're warming them up with an article before we even talk about the product. And so we measure that every two weeks. It should be more than that, but it's a very manual process the way we do it because it's kind of mm. a, 
I want to say a system that I, I don't say, I don't want to say I invented it, but I took pieces that I learned from a bunch of different people to make our system of Google ads to a blog article, blog article to Amazon. And so we have to measure that with Amazon associates, which is an affiliate link. And so we measure the affiliate versus the ad spend. And then with Amazon PPC, we're spending close to uh, $50,000 a month on that. And so we're measuring that every single week. We just look at it. We actually watch some things every day so we can scale them, but most of it's just every week. So there's two different platforms on Amazon right now. Um, and we're, we're using both of them and we measure those on a weekly basis along with our Google ads. And then we have our Facebook ads that we only use for retargeting. We don't do prospecting on Facebook. I don't think it's worth it in our, from what we've tried in the past, it just hasn't worked for us. And so, um, we just do remarketing with Facebook and it's a retargeting and it's cheap and it works incredibly well. And then right now we're playing with a software called Storia, which is AI based display ads and it works incredibly well. Um, it's not much work for us, but they're doing a great job and we're, we're scaling those. The, the software we just implemented this last quarter was called Git emails, which is an interesting, interesting software. Um, it takes the user data, your, your cookie, mm -hmm. so to say of people that show up on your website and it compares them with data that's been sold. So like if you've ever signed up for those like contests, like when you pay off your mortgage or win $10,000, you are selling all your data. That's what Absolutely. you're doing there. And so what happens when you enter these contests is you get, go into this huge database that's available to purchase. And so what get, get emails does is it takes that database, it matches it up with people that are on your website and it gives you email addresses. Now this is illegal. It's not legal in Europe but it is legal in the U S because in Europe, it's an opt in email system. So you have to physically give them your, you have to get their email address in order for you to be able to email them. Whereas in the U S is an opt out email system. So we, as a business owner, you can get their email any way you can, but they have to have the ability to opt out. And so what we do with this is we're very ethical with this because a lot of people will think it's unethical. It's illegal. You shouldn't be doing this, but People are landing on our blog They're They have a problem and we're just following up with them. We're not spamming them. We're following up with them to help them with their problems. So they show up on our website and then if it connects them and we don't have them on our email list, we'll send them an email saying, thanks for visiting. I love the makers of hydrate. We saw that you were, we, we saw that you may be more interested in dry eye. And so here are some suggested articles for you. Here is a free copy of our dry eye book as well. Over the next couple of days, we're going to be sending you a couple of emails, letting you know about other patients and how they've had successes. So we don't spam them. We just, and then we give them the ability to opt out. So if you want to opt out at any time, you can click right here. And so we, we thank them for visiting and then we just give them what they want. We tell them what dry eye disease is, what causes it, how you can help it, what you're doing that you should be doing. And so we're not saying buy our stuff, buy our stuff. So that whole email sequence that we give them with that is actually all blog based. So we just keep sending them to blog after blog, after blog, after blog. Of course, the blogs talk about our products, but that has actually been really successful. We've, we're getting about a, a probably a four or five return on ad spend on that because you pay 25 cents an email to the software and we're making, you know, anywhere from a dollar to a dollar 50 per email as a result of that. And then we have their email forever. And not just, for, that's just the one-time transaction. So that's something we actually just started exploring this last quarter. And um, I'm doing my quarterly planning right now for Q3 and Q4. And so I don't know what I'm going to bring in next. So that's kind of, we, we get really nitty gritty. We, we ch check the measurables every single week with how much we're spending on each software or ad platform and how much we're making with each one. Um, but we have lots, a ton of other KPIs, but that's the advertising KPIs that we follow. I have to say, I'm sitting here listening to you, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I see the foundation for a lean, very, very niched down marketing agency, specifically tailoring optometrists. I, I see that there. Um, but I, I think what you're doing and how you're doing it is, is really, uh, you know, really, really uh, brilliant. Um, 
and, and I'm not just saying that, but I'm just really happy to see what you're doing and how you're, you're getting things off the ground in a very organized, deliberate way. Let's take a step back for a minute, if I can, and ask you as an optometrist, because you've been on both ends of things as an optometrist and now using digital marketing, you know, very, very proactively. How would you speak to the optometrist practice today, knowing what you know with COVID, with the economy? You know, people like myself are very cautious about going in and physically getting your eyes examined. I don't want to be in a waiting room with people who may or may not be wearing masks, knowing that I could potentially contract it, you know, through touching my eyes or what have you. How do you, how would you advise a struggling uh, optometrist right now trying to build their practice, let alone taking things online? If that's a fair question. It is a fair question. It's, uh, it's got my wheels turning. I'm like, maybe I should come out with an optometry agency. <laughs> but I, 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 if I could do it right now and I was, you know, 10 years younger, that's what I would do. I would pitch it to you. So I think the first thing that, that optometrists need to do is going back to social proof. Social proof is everything. And right now it's more important than ever because you need to be complying by what the COVID standards are. I'll give you an example. I live in Austin, Texas. Austin is very proactive when it comes to everything with COVID. Everybody wears their masks inside any, any store. Everywhere has got plexiglass. All the restaurants are spaced out. Table Tables are spaced out. You know, there's a table between. On those tables between, there's hand sanitizer and there's there's alcohol wipes. And so no matter what you're thinking, like there's disinfectant everywhere. People are being proactive. I'm back in Ohio. I'm back in my hometown of around Toledo, Ohio. And we're visiting my, my in-laws right now. Um, and then my parents live in this area too. And we come up here for the summer. Nobody wears their masks. Yes. No restaurant has complied in any degree. I've seen maybe a couple masks by the workers, but that's it. Even yes. some of the workers don't have them on. Just like where we are. And so if you're an optometry office or you're an office in general, if you're brick and mortar, the more you comply by this, the better. Because it's showing that you're proactive and you're, you're taking things seriously because... And it doesn't matter if you're along the lines of you should wear a mask or you should not wear a mask. That's not what we're talking about here. What I'm talking about is my wife does not like to do business with businesses that have done nothing. When she walks into a place and she sees that they've done nothing to even protect themselves, their workers, or the, the, the population, she will not go back to that place and she would leave them a one-star review. Whereas in a place that's proactive and has the hand sanitizer available, has masks available, she likes those places a lot better. So like Allegiant Airlines, we just took a flight up here. At the beginning of the flight, when you walked in, they had a mask for you if you wanted it. And they also had these little alcohol hand sanitizer wipes. So you could wipe down the seats in front of you before, even though they did it. You can do it too. That made her feel good because we have our son with us and he's going to be touching everything. So that made her feel good. So if you're not taking proactive approaches to do stuff like that, people will leave you bad reviews. And in kind of switching to that, they'll leave you good reviews too. Now, going back to the reviews thing, when people check out of your practice and they're leaving, the first thing that we did as a practice is we actually had a MailChimp sequence. This is back in 2015 when MailChimp was big, but it wasn't as big as it is now, but it wasn't too big back then. And what we do is we would plug their email address into a MailChimp sequence. And the first email they got from us was, 12 hours later, asking them how their visit was. If their visit was great, we'd then ask them for a Google review. It's just like we do on Amazon. We ask them how the product is. If they say it's great, we ask them for a review. We just try to provide great customer service. And so you can do that with your practice. You can plug them into a MailChimp sequence, ask them how their visit was. And if it was great, ask them for a Google review or a Yelp review or whatever review, because and ask them to say what they liked about maybe what you were doing to prevent the spread of COVID because people are looking at those reviews now. And if you mention something like, Hey, they had hand sanitizer everywhere. They had masks that you could get 
when you arrived, then that's going to make them want to go visit you more. Now, I think we need to get rid of the waiting room. The waiting room is key to eliminating that in a doctor's office and getting people right to the back. And so if that means eliminating paperwork, or if it means having your team fill out paperwork in the room, that's what we need to start moving towards is just moving people right through the office very quickly and getting them out as fast as possible as well, while still providing thorough care that they expect to receive. But I think this is almost eliminating the waiting time in a doctor's office because nobody wants to be sitting around a waiting room, people coughing and everything. So I feel like it just needs that you need to change your flow a little bit more. We actually did this when we were in practice is we eliminated the waiting room is in the paperwork that 10 miles long of paperwork. We limited it to one page front side only. Most and then my team filled up electronically, right? You can, um, it's tough with customers or patients because they have to be able to do it. And so it's a new system for them. So what we did is we actually had our team do it for them and then they would just do it in the exam room for them. Okay. How can, let me see how to ask this. How can optometrists, small business owners, entrepreneurs, in your opinion, knowing what you know and, and what you've done, how can they budget for effective digital marketing and Amazon advertising and Amazon FBA if they if they want to get into that? How do you break that down into something uh, something that is is achievable for them if they feel overwhelmed? Because I'm sure you felt like that when you first started. Yeah, um, you know, there's always professionals that can do things for you. And that's the biggest thing that you can do. But with, I'll answer the Amazon question first. With Amazon, if you want to get into selling on Amazon, and if it's just products that are around your office, like if you're selling my lid scrub in your office and you want to sell it on Amazon, you can't do that actually because we have you signed a contract. But just for an example purpose, um, if you had my lid scrub and you wanted to sell it online, you first have to make sure that you can do that because some, some suppliers don't allow you to do that. But you can do something called fulfillment by merchant. Fulfillment by merchant is just simply where you put your listing on Amazon and whenever an order comes in, it comes to you, the practice owner, it can come to your practice and then you just ship it from your practice. You, you create a fulfillment center inside your practice. And if you're selling a hundred per day, it's not going to work. You need to hire a professional to do that. But if you're selling one, two a day, your team can do that. Your team, you train them to check the email because they're probably already checking email anyway. If you sold a product, they click one button print a shipping label and they slap it on a box and they send it out that day. So you could do fulfillment by merchant if you wanted to sell on Amazon. Now, going back to digital marketing, this is a great question because I think that optometrists, dentists, chiropractors, medical doctors, all of them don't spend enough money on digital marketing. There is so much possibility to spend. There, there's just a plethora of options out there from Google ads to Bing ads to Facebook ads that you can do for your local practice that can get you a ton more patients. I was actually working with a, a, a DO, a doctor, an osteopathic doctor mm -hmm. here in Toledo, Ohio, actually. And we were doing an SEO YouTube strategy. And so we developed a whole year plan of blogs and videos that he could do, and it would boost his SEO. And we took his practice website from getting 20 hits a month all the way up to 2,000 hits a month within a year. And we did that just simply with SEO. We, we did articles, blogs, and mm -hmm. videos about problems that he solves. And so then we didn't quite get to this phase yet. Um, but when people show up to these blogs, there's a pop-up and that pop-up, you know, gets their email address. And then we start marketing them with email marketing. And what this allows you to do is then whenever somebody in your area is searching for a vitamin B12 shot, which is one of the problems he solves, you're going to be at the top and you're going to be at the top of the SEO. And if they show up on your website, we're then going to retarget them on Facebook. So I think the biggest loss that offices are making is just retargeting. If you have people visiting your website, you're spending money to get people there. You're trying to get people to your website and you're not retargeting them over and over and over again. So they see you nonstop. You're doing a huge disservice for your practice. You're losing 
the, the, it's just a huge hole in the bucket that is just pouring out water. And go ahead. You know, I was just going to say that, I, that as a digital marketer myself, the issue that I see so often is they're the client side. They're not necessarily convinced of the ROI. So from, from my own perspective, it puts you in the stance of, do I want to try to convince you of the ROI? and try to get you to basically cross the street and come over to my side of the street. But absolutely the retargeting and the SEO and the integration of video with content creation is a huge, huge component. Yeah. And the crazy thing is one patient can be worth 300 to a thousand dollars. Our yeah. average patient in our practice was 378, which is higher than, the national average, national average is usually around 278, 300, but it's, it's amazing to me when, when doctors are just like, I don't want to spend a hundred dollars for a lead. And it's like, but you make $300 on this lead. So why wouldn't you spend a hundred dollars for it? I'm, I mean, you're giving me a dollar to give you $3 back. Wouldn't you do that all day long? And that's all. <laughs> I would. And it, it's just, it's hard for them to get the whole mindset around that, but then they'll go pay yellow pages five thousand dollars a month and it's just like where, where's the disconnect here <laughs> welcome welcome to my world uh, yeah that's why i used to have hair um let me ask you what is the easiest most effective amazon ad you can create not as an optometrist unless you want to go in that direction but as a, a business owner saying i need traction yeah so as a brand owner if you're advertising for Shopify and everything, the easiest thing you can do is list your product on Amazon and start what's called a brand defensive ad. And a brand defensive ad is just simply your brand name. You're just advertising for your brand name. Because like I said, when somebody's seeing a Facebook ad of you, they're going to Amazon first, typing in your brand name. And if you don't pop up, if your competitors pop up, they're going to most likely buy them first. And so just doing your brand name is huge because if you dominate your brand name, they're going to buy you. It's hands down. Like I said before, we have trouble with this because we have pharmaceutical companies attacking us and they're paying $50 per click, which we just can't afford that because we're a smaller company. Um, but usually with brand campaigns on Amazon, you'll pay like 10 cents a click to make a sale. And it's just, it's, it's such low hanging fruit. And so if you're a brand owner, get on Amazon, start an ad campaign for just your brand name, and you will make a ton of money just from that. And you don't have to do everything else to optimize Amazon. Just do that and you'll be fine. If you're ready to, to scale up Amazon, you can do everything we talked about before. Plus you can do advertising for search terms, which are what people are putting in to find your product. So again, going back to the eyelid wipes example, our brand name is Mediviz. Our other brand name is Hydrate. And so when you type in Mediviz, our eyelid wipes will be at the top. When you type in eyelid wipes, you're going to see all our competitors too. But we want to be at the top. We also want to be organically in that first page as well, just like on Google. And so to do that, you have to do more optimizing and you have to get more sales and you have to do more strategy. But the easiest thing you can do right away is put your product up there and just do a brand defensive campaign by advertising on your brand keyword, but also your name. So on our products, we advertise for Hydrate. Dr. Travis Ziegler, Dr. Jenna Ziegler, Dr. Ziegler, I love, and just like all of uh, the all encompassing brand name that we have. And I do this on Google too. If people are typing my name to find me, I want them to go to a page that I control. And I want them to go to a page that is all about me, not some, uh, like no offense to, to you, but not some podcast or site that I was just on once. I want them to go to what everything that we do as a company, right. everything that we stand for and everything. I want to control that. And so you do, should do that on Google, but you should also do it on Amazon as well. Okay. Let's switch gears as we kind of wind down here. Can you delve into the charity that you started and the mission work and how that relates to the business end of what you do? Does one support the other? whether it's financially or spiritually or, or, or morally? Yeah, great question. So I Love Cares Foundation is our foundation that we fund. Um, we put out, we take 1% of all money that goes into I Love 
goes into that not profit, not revenue, but all money that hits the bank, 1% goes over to the charity. And then we also have our agency side and I donate a lot more to charity. There's no percentage on that, but it's more than 1%. Um, it's pretty much, we just, we just keep donating to the charity and the charity is to help heal or to help the 1 billion people that are blind due to lack of glasses. And so what I mean by that is you and I can go to the store and buy a pair of reading glasses and put them on and be able to read. Everybody over the age of 40 to 50 starts to lose that ability to see up close and to read. It's a natural part of our, our aging of our eye. We have a lens inside our eye. The lens, I'm going to get a little nerdy on you, but the lens inside our eye, it bends to focus our eyes. So when we're looking at something far away, so I'm looking across the street right now, my eye is relaxed, my lens is relaxed. I'm now going to return focus to the camera. My eye flexes its muscle, mm. it bends the lens, and that helps us see up close. Now, we add layers to this lens every single day of our lives. As we add layers, it gets thicker, it gets harder and more rigid. So then you need a pair of reading glasses to help with that. Right. Now for you and I, yep, exactly. So you and I, we grab a pair of readers, we put them on, we can see again. But for somebody in a third world country that doesn't have access to Dollar General and Walmart, doesn't have access to reading glasses, doesn't have, have access to an eye exam, doesn't have access to the education needed to know what's going on. So therefore they think they're going blind and it's scary to them. And that's what our mission work does. We go on three missions a year. Springtime, we go to somewhere in Latin America, either South America or Central America. In the summer, we go to somewhere in the Caribbean. And then in the, the fall, we go to Jamaica every year. We love Jamaica. And so we go to these islands and we set up a, a clinic where we give them a full eye exam, a pair of glasses, a pair of sunglasses, and a hat. We've also, in Jamaica only, we now do cataract surgery. We do glaucoma surgery. We do diabetic surgery. And so we, we've advanced the, the clinic down there because we're there for a month every October. And so it's, it's fun to, to go to these places because to give you an example that I, I usually always give, a fisherman, a fisherman's fishing his whole life. He's providing for his family. He then turns the age of 45 to 50. He can no longer line his hook. Therefore, he loses his job and therefore becomes a beggar instead of a provider for his family. So he has to beg on the streets because he can't see to, to line that hook anymore. He comes to our clinic. We give him a pair of glasses. He goes a pair of reading glasses. That's 50 cents at our stores. We give him a pair of those. He goes back out. He can line his hook. He can provide for his family again. That's kind of like, that's my made up story, my hypothetical story, but it happens every single day because we're in the Caribbean. Now, another story, this was somebody that was nearsighted. So they actually couldn't see far away. This kid was eight years old, uh, minus 10. So he could see about this far in front of him and no further. So he couldn't see the board at school. We put a pair of glasses on him when he was, uh, when he was eight to 10 years old. I forget the exact age he was. This last trip that we were on, this is like our 12th year going to Jamaica. And this last trip that we were on, he is now the manager at the Sandals because the Sandals Foundation is amazing. The Sandals Foundation is the, the foundation arm to Sandals Resorts. Mm -hmm. And so they put us up when we go to Jamaica, which, is, which isn't a bad gig either. But um, he was the manager of the Sandals. And he came in for our orientation meeting and he said, I just want to tell you guys that I'm 22 years old now. And 12 years ago, when you guys were here your first year, you gave me a pair of these glasses. And I was failing in school until I got those glasses. I got those glasses. It changed my life. It turned my life around. And now I'm the manager at the sandals at the age of 22. And so that's the impact that you have by giving somebody a pair of glasses that they can't afford or obtain. You can change somebody's entire life. The economic impact that glasses can cause is huge. We think in Jamaica alone that we're responsible for almost $100 million in economic impact in the island alone just by providing glasses mm -hmm. because you're providing jobs, you're providing a way of life. And then to go back to a very simple case, you're providing a 70-year-old to be able to read her Bible, which she loved to do, but she can no longer do it. And so if you go on a mission trip with us and you don't cry on your first one, then you need to check your pulse because I've almost cried on every single one because of the impact that you make. And it's just, it's amazing to see and it's amazing to experience. 
and I've been on about 15 trips in my life and they never get old. They are very tiring and I'm always exhausted, but they never get old. And I always, I just can't wait to go on the next one. And, and, Jamaica's our favorite. and that's how, you know, you're doing something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if people, well, you know, have you ever looked, I don't know if it's as crazy, but it seems like a great idea. And I wonder if other uh, companies like Warby Parker might be interested in partnering uh, with you, with your charity work. They do their own separate type okay. of thing. Yeah, I would think that there might be other optometrists or other uh, similar organization that might be uh, interested in teaming up with you. If people want to donate glasses or donate directly to the uh, charity, uh, is that something that they can do? And if so, how? Yeah, if you want to donate directly to the charity, um, it's ilovecares.org. And there's a donate button there. And I, I'm pretty sure it works. Um, <laughs> ilovecares.org. We don't do much with the, the website itself. Um, you can always reach out to me on Facebook, um, Dr. Travis Ziegler. Reach out to me if you're interested in a donation so I can get you a receipt and everything. Um, for your glasses, though, actually, we do Lions Club. So we actually, mm. you donate your glasses to a local Lions Club. Lions Club actually checks them, cleans them up, and organizes them for us. And then we call up the Lions Club and say we need 20 or we need 1,000 minus 10 glasses. And they have them all in a box for us, and they ship it. So we usually send a container down to wherever we're going, and it's all got all the glasses from the Lions Club. In Jamaica, we actually have a lab, so we can make custom glasses on site if we need to. Um, we don't do that for everybody, but for odd prescriptions and odd our younger kids will actually will make a custom prescription for them so i love cares.org is our website donate your glasses to a local lions club okay any final thoughts or uh, anything you wish i had touched on um you know we we love what we do we love um serving dry eye sufferers so if anybody in your audience is a dry eye sufferer or they suffer from really irritated eyelids so if it's really red around here um, our main product is called Hydrate Lid and Lash Cleanser, and you can actually head to Free Hydrate, freehydrate.com, and you can get your first bottle for free. Just pay for shipping. That's our free plus shipping funnel, and so they can check out. If you're a digital marketer, you can check out our funnel that we have there. You got and a deal. If you're a dry eye sufferer, you can go to freehydrate.com to check that out. And then, if you're interested in, if you're a brand that's interested in going on Amazon, we don't accept everybody. We're a very small boutique agency. Um, I oversee all the accounts right now. I don't do the day-to-day, -day, but I oversee them every week and making sure we're hitting KPIs and everything. So you can head to Amazon PPC Professionals.com. It's a, it's a mouthful, Amazon PPC Professionals.com. There should be a link right there to schedule a call with me or to fill out a form. And once you fill out that form, we'll hop on a phone call to see if it's right for both of us. Um, if I'm not the right fit or our agency is not the right fit, I'll actually point you in the right direction of where you need to go next, even if it's not us, um, because my ultimate goal is to serve people. And I believe that the more I serve people, the more that comes back to us. And so that's what our whole life's mission is, is service. Sounds great. Well, I really enjoyed talking with you. As I've said, I could probably talk to you all day long and get really geeky about all the different uh, irons you have in the fire, so to speak. Um, is there are there any other final uh, websites or anything that you would like to give uh, before we tie up our interview? No, I, I think if again the dry eye sufferers go to freehydrate.com or if you want to see our funnel, and then um, Amazon PPC Professionals.com if you want to, you know, see if our agency is the right fit for you. Also on Facebook we have the Dry Eye Syndrome Support Community. You can join that group, and then the Dry Eye Show is our podcast and our YouTube channel as well. Okay. Well, doctor, I've really enjoyed uh, talking with you and I found it to be very informative as well. So I really appreciate your time. Um, for those watching, thank you for watching. If this video has been helpful to you, please give it a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing. Every little uh, bit helps. And if you're listening, please give us a good review as well or whatever else you can do and, and spread the, the Holy Gospel, as we say. And thank you again, Dr. Uh, Trevor Ziegler. Please stick around for another minute or two. And we're going to tie this interview up for now. 
And thank you, everybody, for listening. And that's it for now. You've been listening to Rebooting Business, the podcast for, about, and by America's small business owners who are ready to reboot and rebuild businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. To learn more about rebooting your business or be a guest on the podcast, please visit www.dms.blue today.